morning, everyone. It's uh, a nice gray Saturday, um, and uh, here we are. Um, I've got to work on those ums. I'm not good at those. So we're going to talk about the old-fashioned way or the old method of, um, of getting wood surfaces to be ready for finish, to be nice and smooth and ready for finish. As you, as you know, uh, for centuries, people have been making furniture in this country and in Europe. Um, and they didn't have a whole lot in the way of sandpaper. The Chinese invented sandpaper, but, or a version of sandpaper with crushed shells, I think, back in the 1300s. Um, but since then, in the early 1800s, we had the introduction of, of sandpaper on paper, but it was probably rather expensive. And, you know, everything was run by the almighty pound or dollar, depending on which it was. And, um, and uh, so you had to have an efficient way to do it. And it wasn't until like the 1920s and 30s that some of the, 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 more, the tougher compounds that they use in sandpaper now were introduced and wet and dry sandpaper that didn't clog as much and so on. So there were other ancient, not ancient, but old methods of of doing it that uh, actually when you get used to them and uh, they're, they're almost faster than sandy. But uh, the, the primary, for a flat surface, the primary way to uh, clean up a flat surface was to use a combination of planes and card scrapes. And a card scraper is very simply a small piece of steel card. It's called a card because it's shaped like a card and it's just a piece of flat steel and traditionally it would be made from an old uh, used uh, saw blade that's worn out or you know perhaps been been sharpened so many times that it's changed shape and doesn't work too well as a saw anymore so they would they would use these and in essence what what you do is you put a tiny blade on each one of the edges of the face you don't use the ends because you've got to hold it somewhere and you are putting a blade on there so if we could kind of move over to yeah. here very quickly, um, excuse my drawing, but this, what, the, what we do with a, when we get a piece of steel like this, it may not even have a straight edge. And just like a piece of wood, we joint it. So we make sure that the, the edge that we're going to scrape with is, is jointed or flat, if you like, or straight. So, Looking at this in cross section and, and mo much enlarged and badly drawn, basically what we, what we shoot for here initially is for, to get the card or get the steel so that in cross section, both of these corners are 90 degrees and this is a flat surface. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a burnisher to roll that over. Well, we're going to go through a few steps first but a burnisher to roll that over and create a tiny little blade right here. Very small and it needs to be refreshed fairly regularly, but we create a tiny blade there. And the sharper and more even that blade is, the better. Um, there's a little uh, write up about the, okay, so we can go back to here, thank you. Uh, up on the, uh, that went up on the website a day or so ago um, that had some pictures of a, of a um, some of a blade close up having been sharpened and you it, it it's not even as regular as saw teeth it's just pretty crusty you can check the website check it this morning it's up there um so the it, the, the it's all about getting your edges as as clean as you can or as 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 as, as sharp as you can if you like so the um the 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 um both this little blade that, that, that I just outlined will actually take shavings off of the wood. So it ac actually will take shavings. It doesn't scrape as such, although it's called a scraper, it's actually a little blade. And so I'm gonna go through the process of preparing a, a blade. I've, I've uh, already used this one. It works very, very nicely, but I'm gonna prepare a card scraper and show you what you need to do if you say buy one. There is a wide variety of qualities out there. Um, some are good, some aren't. Uh, this particular one is uh, made by a company called Barco, B-A-H-C-O, and it, it was made in Portugal. And it's just the kind of steel it's made out of. It's a nice hard steel, but it's still got some flexibility to it. So it 
um, it really uh, comes up nicely. And I'm finding that this is this is for flat surfaces. This this these card scrapers, um, which originated with a company called Sandvik. This is the older version of it. And there's just something about the steel there. Swedish steel is good stuff. <laughs> but um, something about the steel there is, is, is really good. So the first thing we need to do is to make this face at 90 degrees to, I mean this edge, sorry, at 90 degrees to the faces and to be straight all along. So we take a file and all this is, I just made this up, you know, I did, I used, I, I, I confess I used a router table to do it with, but I made a, a little one eight um, channel there and I just took a, 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 a file, a, I think it's called a bastard file, bastard file, there you go. Um, I put it in the wrong way for my, for my use because I'm right handed. But anyway, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just raise this up, put it in the vise. Incidentally, when you, when you put something like a card scraper in, in the vise, it does have those little blades, and uh, you, you, you're going to spend a lot more time renewing it than, than preparing it for the first use. So just be aware that when you put this in a vise, it does leave a little mark in, your, in, in the wood. I actually line my vices with leather and I, I don't have an issue with it, but it can also leave tiny little shavings of, of metal in there. So just be, a, if you're very persnickety about stuff like that, then, then be aware of that. So we take it and put it in a vice, or if you don't happen to have a suitable vice at home or you don't want to use your vice, you can always make yourself a card scraper clamp. And this can, it, you, you cut a, a, a slot with a bandsaw, preferably at 90 degrees there. And then you can just use this as a guide, especially useful when you're new to doing this, because as time goes on, as time goes on, you train yourself to be able to work at 90 degrees. But initially, that can be really helpful for both the, the jointing and for, the, for working it on a, on a um, on a stone. So, but anyway, back to the jointing. So what we do is just go along, we, you know, take a look at what you've got there first. And you'll probably see a slight unevenness to the, to the texture there. And you just go ahead and push that file through. Be aware that when you drag a file back over metal, all you're doing is blunting the teeth. So it's better to run the file just forward. And basically, this is not holding it very well. So we'll tighten it up a bit. This is this vice is really made for carving. What I need is a, is a proper bench in here. Or a vaccination, and then we can use other spaces. Okay, so I'm using the wood to hold this at 90 degrees. And I file there until I got a nice even texture. And you can always put a straight edge on that if you want to, to check it. So now I know that it's reasonably straight. It is of course gonna have burrs on the sides there because we've ground it off there with a file. Um, so the next step, step that we, get, we do is we work it through um, not, a, not everyone tells you to do this, and maybe I'm a little anal about it, but I've found that I get good results if I work my way up through a variety of grits until I get to a nice polish. Um, a lot of people will tell you to stop at a fairly coarse grit, but I like to take it a little further than that. So we're going to work on this face and these two faces. Um, which want to be, again, at 90 degrees and they need to be flat and, and eventually they'll be polished. So I'm going to, first of all, we'll, I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll work down here. I'm going to start with, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I meant work here, but, but uh, uh, I'm going to start with a diamond plate at 1200 grit. As long as you've got a nice flat stone, you might want to use that. I would recommend which one was it that I actually just ground? <laughs> oh, no, it, was, it was the Baco, I know that. And 
There we go. It's nice and clean. So this is a 1200 grit diamond stone. Um, if you're using a, a regular stone, you might want to use the sides of the stone because this will tuck fine channels in it. So if you're using this to, to sharpen your planes, you may have a fine channel where you're missing, missing a little bit. So when you go to stones, it's worth thinking about doing it on the edge, as long as the edge is flat. So I need a little water, not much. And I'm going to start this at 1200. And basically, I'm going to just work it back and forth, keeping it at 90 degrees, moving it around on the plate here, because regardless of the fact that it's diamond plate, I want to wear my my diamonds out evenly. And it doesn't usually take long because you've already straightened the, the blade up. But what one does need to do with a new blade only is to repolish, is to, is to make sure that the sides are also nice and flat so that we can create that nice, clean, straight edge. Okay, so you do need to make sure that you, by whatever method you use, that you get a nice even polish on that. Well, not polish at this point, but on the diamond plate here, and then I'm just going to finish that up with one. Okay, so now I could and would have no issue and normally do go straight to something that's equivalent of 8,000. But I'm going to, as I say, with, when, when it's new, I, again, I'm a little anal, so I work my way up. So this is a 4,000 stone. And I only really use this for card scrapers. So I'm going to use the flat edge of it. I'm going to start off by possibly clamping that. <laughs> That's why they attach those little bits of wood on the bottom, you know. All right. Okay. So now, again, get my edges. And I can see, I don't know if you can see close up, but I can actually see the little burrs on the edge. You can see a black line there as I work it because the edge is getting worked. So you want to look out for that. Make, be sure you're working the edge there, but not, not tipping it up like that. I'm exaggerating, of course, but not tipping it up. Okay, so now I've got, might take a little longer than this under some sort of, you know, under, depending on the, the, the state of the blade that you are buying. I'm only doing one edge here, just for the sake of time. I actually want to get to do it using it. Okay, so now I've got that at 4,000. It's not all that good a polish, but we'll get there. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to joint this. And again, you can see the black line where I'm jointing it. So you move it around the stone in order to keep the wear even. Okay, and each time I work it on this, I can see it's a little closer to a polish. Okay, 4,000 gives you something close to a, to a polish on the edge there. I'm just going to work this face a little bit more. And I haven't got the whole thing. A little bit more water on that with them. Of course, if you've got something to push your stone up against the pin, it's also very good. There we go. All that black stuff is the steel coming off of the blade, coming off of the card. Okay, so now I've got that 
out to 4,000. Now, if you just got stone, you would move to 8,000. Hey, Paul? Yes. A couple of questions. Yes. One is, I'm wondering, given what you're going to be doing with the card scraper, if taking it to 4,000 is really that important, I mean, couldn't you stop at a 400 or a 600 in terms of uh, your sharpening of the edge of the card scraper? Or is there really a difference you get in the result if you go all the way up to 4,000? I like it. Well, we're not, not finished yet. <laughs> so ah, we're, we're, we're going further. 4,000, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I like to go further. I, let me think, put it like this. I sharpen my plane blades to 8,000, right? So if I have planed something and I'm then going to use a blade that is rougher than the plane blade, then I'm going to leave a rougher surface there. Okay, I, I guess if you really think that, I'm sure you know, but it just seems to me like the resulting surface, whether you've used a 1200 or an 8000, it just seems indiscernibly uh, different. And that is to say, is it worth the effort? And maybe it's a personal choice, but that you go to 8,000 is kind of impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably a personal choice, but yeah. I'm, I'm on a journey. I'm not at the, end, at the destination yet. So I'm still learning about these things. So what I'm relaying you is what I found works for me. Okay. One more question for you. Yeah. You are willy-nilly running your finger across the edge when yeah. you're talking to us. And it's as yeah. though you're saying, I'm testing it for how sharp it is. Why are you not cutting yourself in the process? Or do you not have any concern for that? It's a bit, well, two things. First of all, at this point, we're just creating it to 90 degrees. But you have a good point because even that 90 degree edge, once you've shut, cleaned it at 8,000, is a sharp edge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I actually, this one I have, I, 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 I sharpen only at 90 degrees. I don't burnish it at all. And that's really good for in between coats of finish because you can gently scrape without actually removing too much, but you can just scrape off the surplus. Uh, okay. So, so you, um, you do not, it's you're not crack it. You're, okay, but you're not concerned about cutting yourself. I'm concerned about cutting myself, yes. <laughs> and, and there's an edge on this one. The reason I, I sort of neurotically feel the edges is because you, you have to in order to know if you've achieved an edge there. But you do have to be careful running your hand up like that. Right. Which is what that you're is doing a sharp little blade. And it'll yeah. give you a paper cut done with steel, basically. Exactly. But bleed, it, it makes, you know, that red stuff makes a nasty mess on your wood. So. Um, <laughs> oh, that's the reason to not do it, huh? Okay. okay Absolutely. Yeah. That's the major reason not to do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so, 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 Travis, your homework assignment is to sharpen some at 400, test them, sharpen some at 1,000, test them, sharpen at 4,000, and test them. Is the goal to find out at which grit it cuts my finger like a paper cut? <laughs> Appreciate you looking out for my well-being there. We are here to help. Oh, absolutely. Yes, it's all about you guys. All right. So now I am going to take it further. And I'm going to use a ceramic stone because that's what I tend to use on a daily basis on my flame blades as well. Um, the reason I like to use it is because it's very, very, very hard. And it doesn't, it, it does eventually wear out, not wear out, but it will belly out and you have to straighten it up. But it, it takes abuse like nothing else. And I find it works very well. I initially got one to, to work with carving tools, but I'm gonna do the same thing with the edges here. Give them a nice polish, because my whole objective is to get that intersection of the two edges to be as smooth and even as possible. Use water on that? You can do, but you don't have to. I find that I put water on there when I begin to get a buildup of steel. If I put a little water on there, it takes it up and then I can wipe it off. And that's kind of how I clean. 
All right. So yes, this is this is a little obsessive, but you know, you know me. I I, I um, fly against logic, shall we say, sometimes. <laughs> except that once I've flown against logic, I want my tools to work in a logical way. So now I'm doing the edge. And this is actually gonna give me a, a, a visible polish on, on the edge. So this gives me two tests. I know this thing is really flat, so I, I, I can test whether I've got this edge flat and I can look at it to see how even the polish is there. I don't know if you can, I was looking at, at it from my eyes. From my eyes, I can see a beautiful reflection yeah. there off the edge. You can, yeah, it's a little dim for me, yeah, but that's uh, great. So, can sorry? The edge, the, or the, the flat. Oh, show the flat? Show the, yeah. Yeah, do you see the, just the edge, not the back here, but just the edge is polished there. So, which is good because I don't, I, I don't want, I can see that I had it flat, but that's what, that's where I had the pressure with my fingers on that edge. So now I've got everything at 90 degrees. I'm gonna put it in the vise. And this year, at this point, whether you stopped at 400 or you stopped at 1,000 or 8,000 or 16,000 or, or however, far that goes. You want to hold this really firmly in the vise. Now, last year I did a whole session on tarred scrapers and I was taught, raving about this new method where you burnish your, this burnisher, and I'll talk about burnishes in a moment, you burnish your tarred scraper gently. What I've learned myself is for the thinner ones and the ones that I'm going to do really, really fine work, I, that works good. I can get myself a really, really tiny little blade, but with this um, Sandvik or Barco blade, it's a pretty solid piece of steel. It's 80 thousandths of an inch thick, which is reasonably thick. Um, and what, what I do, I've got it polished now. So what I need to do is use a piece of polished steel to create, to round that edge over just ever so slightly, just a few degrees. So I'm gonna do that, but in order to do that, I want to talk about burnishes. There's a couple different kinds. The round burnishes, like this. There is one in the shop that's oval. And then you've got the flat kind. I find the flat work pretty good for the lighter steels, but I don't think you can get enough pressure to turn this over. So what, what's nice about the round one is that you can, all your, all your energy is focused on one spot. And there's other, one other thing that you need to do with this that helps you get that really keen edge rather than just scraping down and, and maybe taking a little bit of steel with you. And that's to lubricate your thing. This is olive oil, but pretty much any oil would do. I just- Paul? Um, yes. Uh, when you burnish, it looked as though you were holding it a less than parallel angle to the surface, maybe a few degrees off. But are, yes. are you simply bending the edge? Are you removing material on the edge? Are you creating a little slope on the edge? What is it that you're actually doing to the edge of the metal? I'm bending it over, so. Can you show us on the diagram on the wall behind you? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna actually magnify this one, you know, is the 90 degrees. So I'm going to show you what we're doing here. Thanks for recognizing the glare there, Wes. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do two sides. One's going to be at an absolutely perfect 90 degrees there. Right? Just don't bring a protractor and come and measure it. Okay. And one is on this edge, which we're going to work on is going to be basically rolled over. So what I'm gonna do is take the burnisher, run it along the length, and initially I'm gonna take it at a very slight angle. And so I'm just gonna push that corner down a bit. Yeah. And then I'm gonna run it a couple of times at slightly steeper angles. So that what I actually do is kind of 
push that edge down just a little bit like okay that. does that make sense yes yes it does is that the leading edge of what you'll be pulling when you do the scraping yes this, this okay. tip here will Got be it. the leading edge Got so it. how far you have to push your scraper over depends on the angle that you that you work it to in other so, words, the angle at which you pull is related to the angle that you put onto the edge with your burnishing tool. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, so another quick thing about the yeah. burnisher that I remember: the key here is that the burnisher is a harder steel. Yes. Than your scraper. Absolutely, yeah. it must be harder. And. Right. I, I've read things by old time woodworkers who say, you know, after a lifetime of using burnishers, I ended up one day in emergency using a, a high quality screwdriver, chrome screwdriver bit. I've tried that. It works great. <laughs> <laughs> you can go out, you can spend $25 on this, but as long as you, as long as it's a harder steel, yeah, that's it. all that matters. I, I personally, I like to have the burnisher. I think it's a little safer because you have room to move. You, you know, you've got room to hold it. But anyway, so I, I'll just run that along uh, just for, I don't know, just like I feel it. <laughs> okay, so then what I'm going to do with this, which is different from before, if you recall, I was talking about doing it while holding it and doing it with fair, not a lot of pressure, there, you know. So this one, I'm going to do a little pressure on. So I'm going to start it at this end. Well, I can't start right on the end because my, my burnisher will roll off. So I'm going to have to come back and just do that little bit. But I'm going to, first of all, lay it at a very slight angle there. And a nice even pressure as I go along. And I'm going to do that enough times that I can begin to feel a little lip there. Not much. Interestingly, it's kind of like you're making a clean burr. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now I'm doing the other side. And again, the angle that you do it at is not so critical as doing it consistently for yourself. So I don't know if my final angle is, you know, 10 or 15 degrees or whatever, but it's what I do. <laughs> And that's what really matters. Okay, but Paul, those of us who use digital tools want to know exactly, is it 10 or 15 degrees? <laughs> it's 11.792476. We okay. can do that. <laughs> <laughs> How many decimal points can we go to? <laughs> All right. Okay, so now I'm going to turn my angle. I'm going to come back and just do that little bit back there. You don't use the edge that much, but you, you do. You'd be surprised how often you use it. Okay, so now I'm gonna give it a bit more angle and a bit more oomph, as it were, a little bit more weight here. And you can feel, as you walk, walk that thing along, you can feel the metal turning. And again, as long as, I move my finger like that, it's usually pretty good. Now I'm not getting the burr I want here. So I'm gonna go a little bit more on the angle, a little bit more energy. I got one side's doing nicely, the other side is not doing so well. So we may end up just using one side. And I'm gonna, that feels wonderful. So you, you, and again, I'm feeling this because I want to feel the same burr all along. I'm not going to run my finger along like that, though, because it's... it's Good call. <laughs> all right. For some reason, that's not coming up as good as it should. So maybe I didn't... There's something there. Okay. So I can feel a little ridge on both sides. Doesn't have to be much, but as I say, this is a pretty hard steel. So my next shots will be, I'm gonna set up wood here 
and we'll, we'll uh, start working. Paul, that board yes. was a very handy prop in my laser cutting class last night. So thank you for having left it there. Oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> I love it when things have a dual purpose in life. There you go. This little piece of pop, ultimately it's gonna go into a little table that I'm gonna, my wife asked me to make me a table that will go above our industrial quality shredder. Um, ah. And uh, ultimately it's gonna be part of the top of that. Okay, so again, going back to our tradition, <coughs> we, as you know, or some of, some of us do, um, you use planes to get a reasonably flat surface. This is, I, this is a surface, uh, I bought this at TH and H, and it's pretty much what you would expect of something that's come from there. It's uh, at least 3S. Three, three um, it's got one rough edge. And it's got a nice smooth surface that if you look at the right angle to the light, you can see all kinds of machine marks there. You can see the just ridges from um, just from the machining, from the jointing and the planing. Um, and they're just all along here. So if we then put some finish on that as it is, it's going to look terrible. So our, our usual resort at this point is grab the RO sander, slap it on there and let's sort it out or run it through a machine at the shop that, that does all sorts of nice things. But the traditional way to do it is to finish it up with what's called a smoothing plane. And the smoothing plane is usually based on a number four. This happens to be a low angle made by a very good company. <laughs> and um, and uh, it's, it's specifically set up so that I can take very, very fine shavings that will leave me with a nice smooth surface and they'll go over all these little ridges and just take them off. So I won't do the whole board, but you have to work it a little bit. You see, I'm taking super fine shavings off there. Um, So I'm going to go a little heavier on this. Oh, is that blade chambered? Very slightly, ever so slightly. Not as cambered as many of my smoothers, but I only recently bought this. So. Paul, are we watching you do a project for your wife? Is that what this is about? Sorry? Are we watching you do a project for your wife? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes, and I'm getting paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm not gonna work the whole board because it's a patient thing. It's all part of that, you know, put, put the music on. Have a heavy enough bench that you can play on is another issue. Yeah. Sometimes the machine marks will be sufficiently light that you can just do it with a card scraper. Okay, so here hopefully comes the magic. <laughs> uh, so the whole key to a card scraper is you do not want to be um, to be uh, mine's gone blank. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Gosh, I can't remember rough. what I want to say. Rough. Yeah, you don't want it to be rough. No, you want it to be nice and smooth. But um, no, what I wanted to say is completely slipped my brain. But, but anyway, you do, oh yes, I know what it was. You don't want to be creating sawdust here. Yeah. If you start producing little piles of sawdust, it means your blade is getting dull and it's time to renew it. And that doesn't take long, but it's commonly, people commonly hold these things with a couple of thumbs like that, and they push it along, along the wood. Now you can see at the moment, it's moving along the wood nice and smooth because I'm just at 90 degrees. You can also, with a nice stiff one like this, you can pull it towards you. So you don't have to be pushing, but what the, the, the thumbs do is they focus 
your energy or your cutting edge right there. They give the, 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 the card just a little bit of a bend, which means that you're, you're just doing one little bit of, the, of it at a time, a bit like a plane, a smoothing plane, which you never take a full width cut on. You just, um, <coughs> you just uh, as you know, Wes mentioned about the camber, the camber yeah, edges, right. you don't take a full width. So, you know, I know in planing competitions, they want you to take a full width um, shaving, but you don't really do that in practical life. So in essence, you, you don't know what this angle is because I really didn't set it at 11.72, whatever it was. Um, so you don't know what that angle is. So the way to feel where, where it's gonna start getting the wood is just to move it along and slowly bring the angle over until you feel a resistance there. And I did that. At that point, I'd just gone about an inch, pushed it over and I felt a resistance. So at the right angle, it catches. Yes. Now I'm going against the grain. But you can see get the mixture of sawdust and little shavings. So I'm close to sharp enough. I do need to switch the wood around though. Although well, that is an advantage of using a scraper on a highly figured wood that it isn't as affected by the grain. Yes. And so you can use it in highly figured wood without getting chip out. Exactly. Because That's the broad surface of the surface the blade, Wes? That's because you're taking so little off and um, it, just because of the nature of, of scraping it. You're okay. taking so little that the grain doesn't matter as much. Got it. Okay. But having switched it around, that's leaving me with a smoother surface. I could have just um, kept shaving that and then just pull this back like this. And as you can see, it takes quite a bit just to clear the crap out there. But even just pulling it towards me, it takes a lot of dust off, but it doesn't give me those shavings. So, it doesn't take that much pressure either. I spend a lot of time pushing that card, trying to push it forward. The other thing is when you start working like this, this little bit here gets hot. Sometimes you have to stop. <laughs> yes. And just, and just let that cool down or use another part of the blade. And I would say that if I scrape this whole piece of blade, those, at least those two edges would be sharp. Once I start getting more sawdust than anything else. I don't want to be scraping too much more. But you see, I'm getting some nice shavings there off of that edge. So you've got to play around a little bit. And now that's beginning to already dull. It's not giving me so much in the way of high quality shaving. So you want to, whoop. <laughs> That's giving me a nice shaving there. But this is, the, these, these are very, very thin shavings indeed. And um, now, yes, yeah, so, so they, 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 uh, they really aren't taking much off. And that is the real advantage, apart from being able to get clear grain wood, as you can see fairly quickly, you know, by the, by the time you, even if you sharpen this up, you know, by the time you set up the RO sander and you set up something to get rid of the dust and, and all of that stuff, and here we just sweep the dust up. And it pays to have a few of these ready. Wes was telling me about, is it rust that has- Rust. He just has a stack of them, rust. So back. And when one gets dull, he puts it on the bottom of the stack grabs another one and at some point just goes through and sharpens them, uh, has a sharpening day and you sharpen 20 of them. Did you say the words sharpening day? Yes. That sounds about right for how long it would take to do 20 of them. 
<laughs> well, actually, once they're uh, set up, once you do it once, it's kind of like with a plane blade or other things. Once you do the important stuff once, going through and resharpening it is actually a lot quicker than starting off with a new a new part. Right. Absolutely. So yes, I'm moving this around. So I'm not yeah. going to demo it too much more. But yes, you can usually get a few more uses out of an edge just by going through. I, I know why that edge didn't come up because I missed something there. When I was uh, burnishing here, before I burnished it, what I failed to do, and I'm sorry. Bring it off. Bad, bad man. <laughs> so, okay. Imagine we're at the point where I'm just about to burnish this this off. I've got a nice polish on there. So now, again, lubrication is still on there. You don't need much lubrication, but you do want a little. What you do, you set it up, set the blade up right at the edge here, and you my the guy that taught me how to do it described it as sweeping the crumbs off the table, and that's the action that you want. You want to be absolutely flat to the surface here and acting as if you were sweeping crumbs off the table. What that does is it puts that final edge and polish on that, on that face and then you flip it over and you do the other side. And then you burnish it. So why don't, we, why don't I do that? <laughs> okay, so this I've, I've worn it a little bit. So we'll, we'll say this is it, one that's gotten dull, and I'm going to just try and touch it up. So I do want some more olive oil here. I'm still relatively new to this media thing, so forgive me for forgetting stuff. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's a really critical point, this. So again. Get that right on the edge. Usually your bench is the best place to do it and sweep the crumbs off the table. So that little ridge that I've created or that little blade I created is now being removed. So now I can feel that's absolutely flat along there. And I can feel, again, what happens is as you do this, you can feel the little burrs under your um, burnishing thing. And once you go along there and it's nice and smooth, you've achieved what you want to achieve. So now I can feel no ridge on there. And I can't really feel a ridge there as well either. So now back to. Well, while you're doing that, the yeah. question was, what is an equivalent sandpaper grit for what you're doing? There isn't really an equivalent because depending on the fineness of the blade, what we have here is a surface that is not a scratch pad. It's more of a yes. blade cut. So it's closer to, it's not a polish, but it's closer to a polish than a sanded surface. So there really isn't a comparison. There's the, 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 the most folks are taught, and I was taught that you sand before putting finish on, you sand to like 180, 220, something like that. And that gives you a reasonably smooth surface that if you put a few coats of finish on and you sand between the coats, you can get a really nice smooth surface. I recently read an article in Fine Woodworking, I think, that argued that you should actually if you want a really nice finish you should take it up to 400 or 600 grit with your sanding and then put your finish finish on to get that smooth surface a lot of people would argue against that saying that the the finish won't bond with the surface but um if it bonds with a virtually polished surface i don't see any harm in in uh, putting it on 600 i'm i've, I've tried it with and it certainly gives you a very nice finish. But it's, there's not really a comparison. But what I'd say is, if you're playing with this and you're not satisfied with the results, one thing that commonly happens to me is that as I'm working, I'll dig a corner in and I'll give myself a lovely 
divot there. There's oh. two ways to deal with that. If if I if it's because of pressure, then I can just put take a a, a wet cloth and an iron and just re-expand those fibers. If it actually cut the fibers out, then I need to get that down. So if you find that you can't get where you want, just go to 220 sandpaper. 220 sandpaper is still going to give you a really nice finish to finish on. Um, it, it, it's taking me a long time to get really used to using these things. I'm currently making a large tool chest. It's uh, interior is going to be 38 by 24 by 22, something like that. And uh, it's, um, it's almost completely done with card scrapers. There have been a couple of spots where I just gave up and I used 180 and then 220 grit. Well, and that's another thing I've heard about and I've seen actually in action is that if you're going to scrape, you scrape everything. If you're going to sand, you sand everything. Yeah. Because if you sand one area and scrape another, they absorb fission. Absolutely. They absorb the finish in a different way. In a different way. Yeah. Yeah. So, or they, or, or the finish doesn't absorb. You know? So, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, another quick question yes. is a uh, brand for a general scraper, just a general use card scraper. <laughs> you put me well, you're, you're put me on the dime. So I would say in in reality, I think this Barco or Sandvik is, is B A H C O or Sandvik. I bought the Barco one on Amazon, I think. The Sandvik one I bought, what happened was Sandvik became Barco and I, I don't know, they moved to Portugal or whatever, but but um, but they're, 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 it's just a really high quality steel. It's 80,000 thick, which means you don't have to press too hard in order to get that little curve, actually. You know, where I find that the, the, the finer ones are more difficult to get that curve. Um, um, yes. You had told me you gravitated towards a really satisfying quality scraper. Is that this Baco That's the one. and Savic brand? Yes, and I will give you. No, I can't. I can't read it. I was going to give you. I will send you or or, or post on the comment. I don't know if you can read the first, but there's a part number there, and um, W four dash one five zero dash zero three zero. I think zero eight zero. So the zero eight zero is the thousandth okay, of an inch. Okay, it's a stylized eight. <laughs> <laughs> or worn out <laughs> oh yes it is it's a military style so yeah it's w4 150 080 and the 080 be the thickness yeah and uh and you can find that on amazon or you can look on ebay and just look for uh, if you put in the name sandvik s-a-n-d-v-i-k there's still a lot of these out there and if you read about them, you'll find that people just rave about them. Um, but the Barco one, I think, is just as good. Be, trying to be a, as objective as I reasonably can, I think the Barco one is just as good. So, anyway, I'm going to. A nice edge there. Finish the set. Yep, yeah, I'm going to give it a little bit more angle there. When you use a burnisher as opposed to say a steel or a knife in a kitchen, um, when, you, when you're sharpening a, a knife to cut meat and vegetables with, you actually want a little bit of a rough edge on your, on your edge. Whereas when we're sharpening for woodworking, we want those blades to be as smooth as they possibly can be. So, okay, so I've re-sharpened re this one that was getting warm. Look at that. Look at the difference that just making the just uh, burnishing that edge did. It's just giving me totally different results. Much, much better. And I can still see a little bit of those ridges, but they're almost gone. As you can see, we're taking 
almost plane like shavings off. That's amazing. And I've probably cracked this one before, but you know how when your shavings are thin enough is when you let go of them in there and they just stay in me there until then you're not thin enough. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's why my blade didn't come up. You see how much of a difference that makes just having, having actually done it properly, which is what I came here to try and tell you guys how to do today. So can you do the yeah. outline, Paul, can you do the outline again of what the right sequence is? Because we did the perpendicular and then the burnishing, but now you say yeah. there was a step in between. So what is the proper sequence again in summary? Okay, so just as when we were doing the edges, I would do the, I, the faces, I would do the faces first and then the edge. Always get that face nice and flat first and then create your burr. And again, feeling it will tell you whether you've got it flat enough or whether you've got a burr there to start with. And as you work these things, you can feel, by doing this, you can feel whether it's getting worn out or not. This side feels really worn out. But does that make sense? Yes. Well, so, and then, yeah. and oh, then I'm sorry. Is once it's square, what do we first do? First thing you do, yes, is you actually pull it off vertically. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Then you roll it over. Yes. So you start by running it along this surface here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And and then. So you do those two, and then you burnish that over. Okay, so, okay, okay. So you end up that, with that's the marker. Yeah. So, so you end up with it kind of going up a little bit. Yes, kind of. Yes. So what's going to happen is you're going to, I'm going to exaggerate this for the purpose of looking at it. You create something like that, or perhaps more like. So you get a <laughs> dimple. You get a dimple up, and then you get a dimple out. So yes. you force it up and then you bend it out. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Right. Critical thing is that that edge be nice and smooth. And then this is also something very often people get the angle wrong here. So you almost want to have a finger on each end and be holding that down on the, on the edge there. Because it's so tempting. It's because you do that a couple of times and sometimes you haven't completely got rid of the burr and it's so tempting just to roll that over and do that, but that then you're creating something that's going to get mashed as opposed to push. So this is a critical step, just because it's critical in terms of getting that face there. Does that answer it a bit more clearly? It does. Yeah. Now I get it. Thank you. <laughs> With the time we have, I think maybe we talk about the other scrapers you have. Yes, I'll show show a few others. So. <laughs> You can, in most of your scraper kits that you buy, and I would say if you're going to buy, let me see, this one is a Shot Fox, for example. Yeah. And um, I, that's I have a good one brand. of the kits from Rockler. Yeah. It, it works fine. Yeah. Uh, I think these are just like planes in that you get a cheaper one, uh, you're going to have to sharpen it more. Yeah. It, so you can get it to work well, but you may have to sharpen a little bit more, but you learn to sharpen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, the more, and you will get plenty of practice if you decide to use a card scraper. However, you will, you know, for the usually less than $10 for each individual scraper that you pay, you'll save that in just a few, you know, a few applications because, you know, you know, the dollar a sheet sandpaper just goes rapidly. So other shapes. Because, you know, again, traditionally, um, furniture was not just, you know, it wasn't until the craftsman era that it was only, um, you know, tended to be only uh, sharp edges there or, or 90 degree edges. So there are other shapes available. This one, for example, is more for little narrower spots. Yeah, there we go. So I, the edge that I sharpen up is just this edge and just this edge. You don't want to have all the edges sharpened up because it's so easy to cut yourself here. And you will, you'll just be, it takes a little get used to using a card as well because uh, um, 
because because you do have to hold it in such a way that you don't cut yourself. Um, but uh, but something like this is great. You don't need to press press your fingers right in there. You can just scrape it across, and it, it you know it's great for getting into corners, getting into little spots. Then you have some fairly two standard curves. Um, so you can do concave surfaces here. Um, and you follow the same routine. You joint it the same way. Um, obviously, uh, you're not going to get a perfectly flat jointing there because it's curved. But you can, um, you can still do it on, you know, perhaps by, the, by that method. You know, just, just rolling it there. Um, I use slip stones on, on something like a concave surface. Um, don't use these that much because I'm not that, you know, have these particular curves I don't, don't do. And I, I do a lot of that sort of curves with spoke shaves and very often spoke shaves will leave you with a good enough finish right there. So um, another shape that you'll see very commonly is this swimming pool shape. I don't know what it is. Could be shape. French, French curve. French curve. French there you go. And it's, I, I've got this thing jointed pretty much all the way around because it's just, it, it's lots and lots of different curves. So again, you know, if you're, um, you wanting to, you know, imagine this were a curved surface, you might scrape. Would you just sharpen the portion of the edge that you want to use? That would be a matter of personal choice. Wow. Um, it would probably save you time and save you having to be careful, about, so careful about your fingers. Um, yeah. I've, I've had very little cause to actually use these, so I can't yeah. really speak to you. And I think the key with that is sharpen it as you find you need an area. Yeah, right. And you'll determine what areas you use all the time. Yeah. And then you may even wear out a saw blade and create your own shapes, you know. Well, that's, and that's actually another thing I was going to mention is that you can make them out of like a saw blade or something for certain profiles that you make. So for molding and that kind of stuff, you can actually make a profile to scrape your molding. Absolutely, you can. And when we had the class with Garrett Hack a couple of years ago, um, he taught us how to do th do things like that. So you can, you know, make a, um, you just basically, you take your, your, um, take a little piece of steel and you, you, you file out the shape that you want, you know, if it's a bead or whatever, and then you do exactly the same thing. You sharpen up those edges. That's where you, it really is helpful to have some good uh, ceramic slip stones. But yeah, you can do an awful lot with a little plate of steel, um, an awful lot. Um, you know, again, he taught us how to use that same same method, just basically using a, a small, this is much bigger than what he suggested, but just a wooden block in which you hold the molding that you need. And then you just start working it back and forth. And it's just like the card scraper. It has a little blade on the edge. He recommends doing it at 90 degrees rather than rolling it over because it's a lot easier that way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can create little, if you want to create a, a, a piece of stringing that's a 32nd of an inch thick, you can do it with this. And I don't know if you can buy a tool that will do that. I think you can. Very soon, can, probably will sell you one for you 100 You can buy anything bucks. as long as you have the money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, um, there's one last thing. Would yeah. Be, can you go through your process for rehoning? So you have one yes. that's good, but it's dull. Right. You don't go through the whole process. Right. Okay. Whoa. Dang, gravity. <clears throat> yeah. That's something else I demand of my tools that ideally they'd be droppable <laughs> without too much damage. So let's take one that this is a diff different brand. Let's have a look at See, all that's giving me is a little bit of sawdust. It's just, that's a little better, but it's still sawdust. It's not very good shaving. Oh, it's quite nice shaving. So we'll, we'll do the edge that's really dull. So the key to that, again, put it on the 
flat surface, your bench, just as long as it's a nice steady flat surface. Again, you got to hold this somehow secure this if you're going to use both hand, both fingers, but um, I'm going to use just pressure there. And again, I'm just going to run along here. And by putting it at that angle, it does a couple of things. Rather than scraping it just along here, it's scraping it at a bit of an angle, so it's pushing it out a little bit. But I'm not pressing down at all in terms of that angle. I want it to be absolutely flat to the edge here. So I'll just do that until I can feel that there's no burr there, nothing. Nice and clean. And if I hold it up to the light, you might be able to see that there's a tiny little sliver that's polished there, just a tiny little sliver. And then I'll do the same on the other side. Now you can usually get away with doing this. Just depends on the the the, uh, the the scraper and the hardness of the wood that you're working with. You can usually get away with doing this a few times before you have to rejoin and so on. And even when you rejoin, go to the finest stone that you that will get you there. Because generally speaking, you haven't worn this flat edge out. So all you want to do is get it back to nice and square. So. But, you know, so you'll joint it with something like, you know, 4,000 or whatever, just to get back to that polish. So now I've, uh, I've, I've got both of those edges nice, and I'm going to secure it. I don't have to secure it in a vise. If I'm wanting a really super fine cut, I can hold it in my hand, but I've got a lot more control if I hold it in a vise. So again, I'm, I'm still obsessively checking there because it's so easy to switch it over to the other side and you don't want to, you don't want to double burr. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm going to just run that along there just to clean that edge up because I have created maybe some tiny burrs by, by doing that. And then do exactly what we did before. Because this is a thinner and slightly softer steel, I'm feeling for that edge. I'm going to do the same angle on the other side, or somewhat the same angle. And you may find that you do different angles on different sides. And by doing that, you'll find which angle works better for you. And if you find that it always works better if you do it this way, then you just do one side, flip the card around, and do it the same way. Just depends how your body will work for you. Okay, so I haven't got much of an edge on that, so I'm going to turn my angle over a bit. Now I can feel an edge. Once I can feel that edge, I don't really want to go much, much more, so I feel it more there than here. So. There we go. Yeah, because it's been my experience, you can over burnish them oh yeah and remove that fur exactly and end up with something a little jagged or something smooth so smooth that it won't cut okay so you keep feeling this some some steel will just take one shot others will take a little bit more and again as you get more experienced you'll find that you want to sharpen in slightly different ways for different purposes. Okay, so let's see what we get here. You see that lovely shaving? Yeah. Just working that with steel. You haven't taken to a, it to a stone at all, so you haven't worn much of your metal out. Now, I got something there that that is the bane of the card scraper, which is shudder or juddering. Um, because it actually puts little ridges in there. So if you're, if it starts juddering, you may be either too firm or not firm enough in terms of your, your pressure on the card. But uh, something to do is to turn the card sideways, just like I turn plane sideways and, and we get you it. Yeah, exactly. You do it, and then you can work. To, and you can always work a cross drain as well if you need to. Do you see that? It's giving me a really nice shaving. 
So it didn't take long. And believe me, once you're, once you're used to it, you just come over to the vice, 30 seconds later, you're ready to go again. And that'll do you for several times. Um, Um, one, of the, one of the things I'll do, and I don't know about you, is as I'm using it and I get an edge that gets dull, I'll actually mark it with a Sharpie. I've tried that, yeah. And move I move to another edge, yeah. use that, and that way I can keep track of what, where my dull edges are. I've even tried marking numbers on it. So you go one, two, three, four, and you think, I'll just use them in that sequence. But usually the oils in my thumb wear out the permanent yeah. marker, and I just yeah. end up with a black thumb. But this is a finer, you can see this is a much more flexible blade. And so it's actually giving me a finer result there. So just like the other things you can go from. One of the keys too to remember with this is that's why you want a smooth, flat board when you do this, because as you're scraping, it will follow any hills and valleys that are in your board. Exactly, which is why we plane it first. We don't have to get it to a perfect surface, but, but we definitely plane it first. And, and if you find that you're plane these little ridges, the scraper will take it out. Yeah. From um, a, one other thing I yeah. mentioned is uh, removing glue. Yes. Oh, yes. Glue and epoxy. We were talking about that just last night, weren't we, Travis? <laughs> yes. If you use it for nothing else and you play around with glue and epoxy, try, try using a card scraper for that because you're getting in those little 90 degree corners there and you're trying to work that with a chisel. It's so easy to, to accidentally remove a bit of wood with the glue. But again, the scraper is a little kinder and you run it over epoxy and it, you can see where it's working. And I was just using it with some epoxy yesterday. It's very really gratifying. Good. Yeah, yes. And far and away, the best way to remove epoxy without removing the wood underneath it. Okay, I've made myself a good mess here. So any other questions? It's a few minutes after 11. Did you advance your wife's project as far as you'd hoped you would? I'm sorry? Oh, did, did I? In today's session, advance the project as much as you'd hoped to? Oh, absolutely, yes. You guys have given me a, a, just a jump on that. Right. But what I am going to do is I'm going to design this one in SketchUp, which I just learned. And I got to say, you guys, whether you're into hand tools, whatever you're into, if, if, if you like to make your own things, Take Julia's SketchUp class. It is such a good class. And she's, she's really got it thought through and she's specifically aimed it at woodworkers. And I am a, you know, I, there's a reason why I'm into hand tools. I'm a kind of an analog guy, but Julia has helped me through it. And uh, Wes helped in that class as well. And uh, it's really, really is incredible value for, for what it is. All right, having plugged Julia and Wes, <laughs> I, um, I guess we're finished. I thank you guys for chat. Sorry. I'm just kind of curious, when is the next one of your uh, sessions? Two, Two weeks? weeks time, isn't it? Okay. Uh, don't, aren't we going with the second and the fourth? Yes, I, but whatever we agreed to is what it is. I just couldn't remember. Uh, and it's good to re just reiterate to people so they can plan ahead. Um, let's see, two weeks from today, that would be the 27th, I think. Let's yeah. Take a peek. Yes, hand tool SIG, 10 a.m., 27th. So great. Right. Great. Okay, and I got a couple of ideas, but um, I thought I probably something plane connected. Airplane? You know, I thought of that. I thought of making, for fun, making a wooden plane with wings on it. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul, thank you very much. I'm going to head out to the garage right now and sharpen up my uh, scraper. <laughs> Appreciate it. Way to go, All right, Jay. have fun and contact me if you, uh, if you, if you get stuck. Thank you very <laughs> much, Paul. Take care. I actually had my nephew, when he was like 15, he sends me an email and says, I want to make a hand plane. I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't realize he was into woodworking this much. 
And so he sent me the thing. A hand plane is actually a small surfboard yes. that you hold on your hand for body surfing. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And, and the guy who teaches the American chair class at Palomar has a business making hand planes, but no blades. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, a surfer. Oh, he's, he's, he's into woodworking. <laughs> no. But his hand planes are all wood, so you can certainly make hand planes. In oh, wood. we did. We made a couple of them for yeah. him that yeah. are out of wood. Yeah, right. And it was an interesting experience. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, because with that, you're dealing with um, compound curve. Cur compound curve. In three directions exactly. in some cases. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Yeah, anything else? Thank you, Paul.